Colleagues, welcome to this Commonwealth of Learning webinar entitled Generative AI Prompting New Opportunities and Challenges for Higher Education. Welcome also to the Commonwealth of Learning Chair, Professor Denise Whitelock, who will be leading this session. Our main speaker, Mike Sharples, and the panelist, Joseph Duart, Paul Prinsloer, Michelle Pride. We are all welcome and we are looking forward to this session. Over to you, Professor Denise. Thank you so much. Um, from the UK, it's good morning to you and all different times for yourselves, but thank you for joining. Um, it is my great privilege and honor to ask Professor Mike Sharples to present to us his thoughts about opportunities, challenges, and what's going on with generative AI. And um, we're looking forward to his presentation and our panel members too, will then open a discussion about the presentation and the issues that uh, I'm sure Mike will raise. So over to you, Mike, and thank you. Thank you, Denise. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here uh, and for joining this very international webinar. Uh, let me first share my screen. <clears throat> So I hope you can all see the, the screen now. Good. So yes. I'm, going to, I'm going to give a very, very quick gallop through generative AI in education, particularly the opportunities and challenges. So let's get started. I'm going to start with ChatGPT and ChatGPT version four, because it's the best known one. But as we'll see, there are many other generative AI tools. So ChatGPT, it's a highly trained text completer and style copier. It now has what's called a context window of 25,000 words, which means it can look back over up to 25,000 words of text, or it can go forwards and generate up to a small dissertation. It can write in any style, in multiple languages, including minority languages, such as Welsh or Catalan. It can be given a direct instruction, and you can see there on the top right, explain string theory in 200 words for an 11-year-old child, and it does an excellent job. It can interpret text and images, and the latest version now uh, will be available to people who have subscribed to ChatGPT version 4. You can see there on the right-hand side uh, a question that has uh, a physics question that is in French, with a diagram and the prompt is in English to answer that question. And it can not only read the text, but it can also interpret that diagram in order to answer the question. So it can interpret text and images. It's a general purpose language tool. And extensions to ChatGPT take it even further. There are plugins for maths, for science, language, media, business. It's now free with Bing Chat, um, the Microsoft uh, Bing browser that provides web browsing, which means it can access up-to-date information and provide links to websites to justify its responses. It also has a code interpreter to run and display Python programs, which means, for example, you can give it a large database and it will um, visualize, interpret, uh, and explain the data uh, visually from using the a Python program. So it's enormously powerful. And it's not the only one. There are many other generative AI tools available now. So there are language models such as Palm 2 from Google with over 100 languages and sp ones for specific subject areas such as medicine, and that's free with Google's um, chat engine, Bard Chat. There's Llama from Meta, which runs Facebook. It's open source, 20 languages, small, simple, free, and efficient. And there's Claude Trou from a company called Anthropic. Uh, and I'll come back to that at the end. But also there are image generators. Um, DALI, which you may have heard of. The third version now is accurate and free with Bing Image Creator. Mid Journey, which produces high quality photo images, 
and stable diffusion, which is free and open source. Um, and you can just see on the right hand side there, uh, Adobe Firefly. So the Adobe company has um, now made available its generative image uh, system based on uh, copyright cleared images. And you can just see the quality, the photographic quality of those generated images. And then there are also a number of other different tools for computer code, the voice, for music, for video. You can see there just the beginnings of what generative video are and specialist ones, for example, Bloomberg GPT, which has been trained on business information. So that's the current state of the art. However, generative AI hallucinates. That's the term that's been used for occasionally producing errors. And the reason for that is that it doesn't know, for example, that it shouldn't invent research studies, that it shouldn't make up academic references. It has no explicit model of how the world works. And in human terms, it's amoral. It's a language model. It's a language generating system. It's not a database or a reasoning system, although it is now being connected up to databases in itself the generative AI language model is not a database. And the OpenAI company, for example, are very clear and explicit about that. Um, here's part of their blog. Um, Despite making significant progress, our instruct GPT models are far from fully aligned or fully safe. They still generate toxic or biased outputs, make up facts, and generate sexual and violent content without explicit prom prompting. So, so far, so bad. Well, let's have a look. Um, so 18 months ago, uh, I started seeing how they would respond to a prompt to write a student essay. So I gave it a prompt. You're a student on a Master of Education course. Write a high quality 500 word essay on a critique of learning styles. The essay should include academic references and evidence from research studies. It should begin the construct of learning styles is problematic because and I press the submit button and it produced an entire student essay. Now, 18 months ago, I was just astounded that it could even do something like that, uh, that it looks like a student essay. It has a beginning, a middle, an end. It has academic references. So in November 2022, ChatGPT was released and uh, generative AI hit the headlines. So I tried it again. And this was the the essay that it produced. You know, it looks like a student essay. However, right in the middle of that essay, there's a sentence. In tracking, learners are sorted into groups based on their perceived learning style, which can reinforce stereotypes and limit opportunities for growth and exploration. Gurung 2004. So I searched for Gurung 2004 on Google, and there is no research study by Gurung 2004. In the references at the end, it produces a very plausible looking uh, academic reference in neat APA style. Uh, the journal exists, the Journal of College Reading and Learning, but there is no paper by Gurung 2004 in that journal. It has invented the research study and the fake academic paper. Why should it do that? Well, the answer is that at that particular point in generating the text, then uh, it's, if you like, searching for a, a piece of text which will carry on that, uh, the text that's already generated, looking for a research study. If it doesn't find one in its data, uh, it will then invent it, it will then generate it, because it doesn't know that that's what academics shouldn't do. So it is effectively doing what it's trained for, generating academic looking text. Now, having said that, that was in November, 2022. I then tried it again with the latest version, GPT-4 in March, 2023, and it produced a good quality student essay with no errors. Uh, I would be happy if a student submitted that uh, as a student essay and the references are all appropriate. So one point I really want to make is that there has been huge improvement since GPT-3 to GPT-4. And I wouldn't recommend using anything other than GPT-4 um, from OpenAI 
uh, for uh, research or for academic use. There's a big difference between the two. Unfortunately, GPT-4, you still have to pay for unless you access it through Microsoft Bing. So where are we? How do we detect if students uh, generate essays using these language models? Well, firstly, traditional plagiarism detectors don't work. The text is generated, not copied. You can't find an original source. There is a new generation of AI-based detectors. They have generally low reliability. They are based on pattern matching. They're not based on trying to find the source text. Uh, the basis behind them is that uh, humans produce more varied language, whereas AI generates more predictable language. OpenAI had a detector tool which labeled 9% of human written text as written by AI. In other words, 9% false positives. One in 10 essays that were actually written by a human, it misdiagnosed as being written by AI. The Turnitin company uh, is has now a, a system which it claims has less than 1% false positives, less than one in 100. However, there is a caveat that that's only when a large proportion of the text has actually been generated by AI. But possibly the clincher here is a paper that was published a month ago, which said that AI-based detectors are more likely to misclassify the text of non-native English writers. And that's a huge issue that it's, if you like, they're biased against the texts of non-native English writers. So what should we do? I would suggest there are basically four responses that institutions can make. They could ban them. They could evade by setting invigilated exams. They could adapt or embrace. Each of them has their issues. With banning confident students, I suggest we'll continue to use AI and we'll challenge the decisions that are based on AI detectors because as we've seen, AI detectors aren't foolproof. To evade, going back to invigilated exams, is costly and limited. Um, we could adapt, but that requires new methods of assessment, new policies and guidelines. And from working with universities, that seems to be the main uh, approach that many universities in the UK, at least, are taking to adapt towards AI. And a few institutions are embracing AI, but that involves a long process of building trust. So this is the emerging policy and strategy that I have picked up from talking with colleagues around the world. Firstly, amend written assessments to make them harder for AI to generate. Move towards more authentic assessments, such as project work. Establish guidelines for students and staff in how to use generative AI reassure and support students in becoming AI literate and developing strategies for effective learning, explain to students how they should acknowledge use of generative AI in assignments and manage suspected breaches of guidelines. And at this point, just for the last few minutes, I want to flip the narrative away from how will AI impact education towards what are new and effective ways to teach and learn with AI. <laughs> So in 2019, uh, I wrote a book based on the Open University's Innovative Pedagogy Report series about powerful pedagogies uh, <clears throat> and indicating 40 new ways to teach and learn. A few weeks ago, I went back to those and asked myself, how could these be augmented by AI? And to my surprise, every powerful pedagogy in that book could be augmented by AI. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. The first one is a personal tutor. So some of us have worked for years on trying to develop AI-based tutoring systems, but now students have a tutor basically on any topic. So I gave the prompt, you're an expert tutor in English for academic purposes. I'm an undergraduate student. I want you to tutor me in the use of English for academic purposes. You should assume I have a limited initial knowledge of academic written English. You should tutor step-by-step step through a chat dialogue continually assessing my current state of knowledge, asking one question at a time and adjusting your teaching to my response. When I ask, you should provide a summary of my current knowledge of English for academic purposes. That's called prompt engineering. That's writing a clear prompt that the system will understand. And then it started. It took me through a dialogue 
uh, a tutorial dialogue on English for academic purposes. And it did a pretty good job, um, not only just teaching step by step, but also picking up on my responses and providing personal replies. And then at the end, I said, please summarize my knowledge of academic writing. And it produced a clear and coherent summary of my current knowledge based on the tutorial dialogue. Another possibility is as a co-designer. So it could assist a group of students throughout a design process. So the prompt I gave here, brainstorm imaginative ideas for quick and easy ways to reduce energy consumption. And these systems have what's called a temperature setting. And the more that you increase the temperature setting between zero and one, the more random it becomes, but also the more creative. So for a design, um, for instance, for brainstorming, it could be an assistant for brainstorming, but it could also take you through the whole design process, producing prototypes, critiquing prototypes and so on. So these are just some of the ways of teaching and learning augmented by AI. And we can come back and discuss them later in the panel if you want to. Beyond GPT, well, there are, there's lots in the pipeline. Microsoft Copilot is uh, going to be uh, introduced on the 1st of November. It will be generative AI inter integrated fully into the Office suite. So every Office tool, such as Word, such as PowerPoint, will have AI integrated into it. And so in the future, it will be no longer easy to say whether a student has been using AI because it will be deeply integrated into the tools they use. There may just be a button when you're using Word, for instance, that just says continue, and it continues with uh, that piece of text or summarize. So you may not know even that you're using AI. Uh, Google Gemini, uh, is a collaboration with the UK company DeepMind, and it will include multimedia, networked um, systems, and problem solving. So it will go beyond just text generation to being a problem solving system. And in the future, social generative AI will integrate with social media and drive social media and interactive entertainment. So we're only just at the start of this um, AI revolution. So to finish, what I want to suggest is firstly, to use generative AI with care. Teaching is a caring profession and the caring professions are probably the last that will ever be replaced by AI or robots. So <clears throat> we should look on um, AI as something that you use with care as part of a caring profession. We need to rethink written assessment um, we need to beware still of AI for factual writing, because even the latest versions occasionally make mistakes. And then the outputs need to be uh, treated critically. We need to explore AI for creative and critical thinking and for argumentation. And to introduce and negotiate guidelines for students and staff and to work with students on developing these guidelines. There's a desperate need also for developing AI literacy, which is very different to computer literacy. Uh, it's about not only how to use these systems, but also the limitations and the ethical issues and to adopt ethical AI for education. There are now more ethical platforms, such as, uh, for instance, Claude 2, which are trained from the outset on ethical principles. So that's a very quick gallop through. Here are some resources. I would particularly recommend the guide from UNESCO called ChatGPT and Artificial Intelligence in Higher Education, a quick start guide. It does what it says. It's a very good uh, and well-balanced quick start guide. And uh, you can see some of the other um, publications from myself and the colleague Rafael perez Breath. That's it. Um, I'll now hand you back to Denise and um, to the panel discussion. Thank you, Mike. But first of all, I think we should show our appreciation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Although it was a whirlwind tour, I think you've packed everything into it that we need to discuss uh, this morning. So, um, Paul, can I invite you first to perhaps raise some questions and issues? 
Oh my goodness. I was hoping I was down the line, Denise. But anyway, <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for for this amazing overview. And at places I had goosebumps and at other places I was very, very scared. <laughs> but yeah, so it, it your presentation and discussion provides much, much food for thought. So recently I discovered the work by an Italian author uh, with the name of Roberto Calasso, who wrote a book with the title, The Unnameable Present. And as we search for uh, for ways to respond to generative AI or how it has recently been called degenerative AI, I do think for the, at this moment, the development and the evolution of ChatGPT and similar services poses for me a deeper question about what this development mean for not only teaching and learning, but possibly more ominously for how we understand knowledge as well as the production and the validation of knowledge claims. So uh, I do think at this moment, in many ways, in the words of Colossu, we are faced with the unnameable present. So uh, the uh, president of the International Science Council, Professor Peter Gluckman from Auckland University said, we are at a tipping point. And then Henry Kissinger and colleagues said, ChatGPT, and they were referring to ChatGPT2 at that stage, will, and I quote, redefine human knowledge, accelerate, accelerate ch changes in the fabric of our reality and reorganize politics and society, end of quote. So I have currently a deep discomfort that in our attempts to explore how to use and how to get our students to use ChatGPT even carefully, that we miss considering a more profound shift in how we understand knowledge, research and the production and validation of knowledge claims. Let me start with a brief remark about slide five <laughs> of your presentation, where, where OpenAI acknowledged that Despite progress, uh, uh, instruct GPT models are far from fully aligned and fully safe. They still generate toxic and biased outputs, make up facts, and generate sexual and violent content without explicit prompting. So I want to stay with the slide for just a brief moment. Consider the following. You have young children, and you are looking for a daycare person or a personal tutor. And when you work through the applications and letter of letters of reference, you find an applicant with a reference letter that states that she or he cannot be really trusted all the time, that they often express toxic and biased opinions, make up facts, and would often share sexual and violent content, and that she and he acknowledges that they are actually amoral. What are the chances that you will entrust your child or your young person to such a personal tutor? Will you appoint the applicant if she or he would express views that slavery and colonization had benefits and that Hitler was a good leader? So what are the chances that you will employ that person? And yet that is what we do when we uncritically, and that's not you, Mike, when we uncritically accept the many possible uses of ChatGPT and how it, li it likes and focus on, on how it can become a personal tutor, provide speedy feedback. I don't want speedy feedback from an amoral actor. <laughs> I, I don't want to have a speedy summary of an article of, of a generator that still generates questions or answers that colonialism had benefits. So, so, and you referred to the UNESCO report, and which I think is really, really very, very good report. And they refer to the fact that ChatGPT models are trained on data from online users, which reflects the values and the norms of the global north. So where does that leave learners with only access to ChatGPT 2 and 3 from accessing and evaluating the content? My other concern is as, as we scramble for regulatory environments and regulatory frameworks, that uh, the frameworks will lack enforcement and that that I, 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 need it, uh, I need us to pause and reflect. The other concern I have is that ChatGPT and its likes totally ignores ownership and authorship and it actually plunders the commons. For years, we warned students regarding using Wikipedia, pointing to its advantages and its limitations. 
But unlike ChatGPT, at least Wikipedia was moderated. The claims were checked, okay, by white men, but they were checked. There was an acknowledgement of sources, intellectual property rights, and copyright. And now it seems that if we embrace a web scraping tool with no regard of context, no regard to where and how it found whatever words to produce in strings that make us as gasp with awe and admiration. So, and I'm and, um, closing is that like authors like Neil Selwyn, Ben Williamson and David Beer, I think we need to understand JTPT as a tool that does not fall from the sky, but that arise in the nexus of social, political, commercial, and economic and cultural agendas. I do think we need to ask, what are the agendas that gave rise to JTPT? Whose agendas are at play? Uh, and Mike, I don't have I don't have the answers. Who benefits and at what cost? And is ChatGPT the white bread for the mind, the bread and circus for those looking for easy and burdenless answers? So I'm closing with, with um, the words by three authors that published recently, early in 23, that they stated, and I quote, the designer of a system holds the power to decide what the truth of the world will be as defined by a training set. Now, Mike, that makes me scared. <laughs> that makes me very scared. And recently I came upon the work and I'm closing with that, Denise, were, uh, on, I, I encountered the work by Antoinette Rouat. She's a French legal scholar and philosopher. And she says, and I quote, the real time operationality of devices functioning on such algorithmic log logic spares human actors the burden and the responsibility to transcribe interpret and evaluate the events of the world. It spares them the meaning-making processes of transcription, representation, institutionalization, and symbolization. And this raises a question for me, what is left for us to do when we abdicate the burden and responsibility of making sense of the world, of transcribing, interpreting, and evaluating the events of the world to a chat bot that plunders the commons? The question is not whether ChatGPT4 works and whether the findings are valid or whether the references are correct. I'm not there. The question for me is to identify the extent to which relying on the apparent operationality of algorithms spare as a serious series of individual and collective uh, and evaluative conventional efforts or tasks and at what price. So yes, it spares as a burner of testing, questioning, examining, evaluating actual, fa actual facts and persons of flesh and blood. And ChatGPT allows us to, to generate facts and, and knowledge claims without draw, pulling these persons to a laboratory or in a court in order to test or question their causes or the intentions. So we are facing a, a crisis of regimes of trust. Um, final word. So how do we embody, Mike, the burden and responsibility of scholarship for our students, showing them what it takes to produce knowledge claims? When I produce an article on, on climate change, what peer review looks like, what a rigorous design process looks like. How do we prevent students and ourselves to becoming used to white bread for our brains and the roar of the crowds in the circus? I'm afraid that much of the current discourses surrounding the regulating the use of ChatGPT in our classrooms and in our research do not take into account the deeper crisis in the regimes of truth in this unnameable present, Mike. And I'm scared of the white bread, white bread for my brain. Thank you very much. Thanks, Denise. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I, I'll leave the floor to Mike for, for a moment, but uh, one of the things, you know, I don't disagree with anything you say, but it raises another question for me, is how do we become an expert? Because chat GDP, and of course, I've been working with NLP for a while, and my work you know, has been in AI, so I'm very excited you know, that something is moving forward in an academic sense, of course. But this system is built on 
lots of money, lots of research, lots of very powerful intellectuals to get us to this state, but they are experts. So my question, if I can build on uh, Paul's um, uh, response, Mike, to add to it before I give you the floor, then how do we become experts? So over to you, Mike, and thank you, Paul. Okay, I mean, I don't, what Paul has raised is very legitimate and very important and topical. It is about what is the status of knowledge, particularly knowledge that has been generated or augmented by a machine. I'm not, to some extent, there is a step change in that now it's not just you know fragments of knowledge, it is uh, plausibly presented uh, and uh, uh, alluring uh, presentations of knowledge that look as if they have you know, academic provenance, they look as if they are generated by a, an, you know, an academic human engine. But I think we, we do need to ask what does it take to produce claims for knowledge? And I, I agree with you, Paul, that we, there's now a new imperative, which is to build this critical literacy. You know, it's, it's been bubbling on for, for years, for centuries, perhaps, uh, in you know, how, how do we interrogate the knowledge that has been produced, whether it's in books, more recently in Wikipedia, through search engines, and now encapsulated in this very plausible looking text that come from generative AI. I guess my worry is that the education system really isn't up to uh, helping students to critique and examine the provenance and the, uh, the, the reliability and the, um, the depth of that knowledge. So I guess I would end with a question, which is how can we work with teachers uh, and other educators to develop this critical literacy that's so important I don't want to throw out generative AI, and we can't throw it out because it's going to be embedded in the tools we use, but we need to develop this critical literacy. And I think education institutions have a real you know, opportunity to develop critical literacy and perhaps let AI to take care of some of the more surface aspects. Um, and also, I think education institutions can make choices, and it's something I didn't you know, indicate in my initial talk, we can make choices individually and collectively about which systems we encourage students to use, which systems we adopt, and how we interrogate the output of those systems. So we're not slaves to the machine. I think we do need to collectively say, what do we want from these systems? And perhaps to work with some of the companies to develop more appropriate systems for education. So I wouldn't just see it in negative terms. I think we have a job to do which is to develop more ethical, reliable AI and to develop a critical literacy. But it's a challenge ahead. Thanks, Mike. Um, Paul, do you want another word or can I ask another panellist to come in? Please, please go ahead, Denise. Thanks, Mike. Okay, thank you. Um, Michelle, would you like to um, respond? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm changing what I'm thinking by every minute. So uh, a thank you for the stimulation so far. And I want to come back to the very beginning of Mike's uh, presentation around the opportunities and challenges and where as an individual, you might sit on that spectrum. And I've had uh, in my institution where I've been uh, asked to lead the institutional response to generative AI, I have had senior staff members say to me, you cannot use the word opportunities. It will mean that students will feel they have to use generative AI. Uh, I like to see myself kind of on the side of the opportunities thing. I probably am a hype person when it comes to generative AI. And I was thinking uh, around this, I believe that to be correct, that half the world's population are age 30 or under. So if we think about that, what is a younger person's response or how does a younger person embrace generative AI? There's going to be very soon a time when people won't know a world without generative AI. Mike said that it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's coming. 
So I think it's absolutely right when Mike says we have to flip how we think. What are new and effective ways to teach and learn with generative AI? And there are so many opportunities. Can we move with the pace that we need to in the systems and processes and structures that we have within institutional, within educational institutions? That would be my challenge back to institutions is shift the way that you produce content for your students, shift the way that you produce assessment for your students. Now you might talk about where are you on the scale? Do you prohibit? Do you adapt? Do you, uh, are you one of the futurists in regards to generative AI? So I think it's really important you know, thinking on the ground, what are we doing and how do we respond? We do have to flip what we're thinking and say, how can we embrace uh, generative AI and what are the news and effective ways to teach with it? Jobs that students are applying for are already advertising for skill sets with generative AI. So we would be remiss if we didn't educate our students in how to use generative AI. Pretty much every field is using generative AI one way or another. Our students need those skills. So, so by banning it, where how are we helping our students? I think another piece from that too is uh, when we were co-creating with students and Mike touched upon that, it's essential that we co-create with students our position statements, our principles, our policies, the ways in which we're going to em embrace gender AI. And one of the things that came out from our students is they said to us, you are saying so positively to staff embrace generative AI yet you were saying to students, here are all the problems with it, here are all the reasons why you shouldn't use it. It was a very negative rhetoric that we were using with our guidance to students as we were developing it. And we shifted our guidance to students as a result of that student feedback. So I think it is really important to think, what are you saying to staff? What are you saying to students? How do those things align? How do we upskill staff? How do we upskill students? How do we ensure that we are prepared? Because it comes back to that fundamental question, what is a university? What is learning? If we come back to what that is, and Mike has showed us very clearly in those, those ideas around what good pedagogy is. How do we take what, what is solid pedagogy and embrace it for now and moving forward where generative AI is ubiquitous? I think the last two points I want to raise around one of the concerns that I have, so while I'm opportunist and I'm very excited, I do have a concern around bias. I do have a concern that generative AI can contribute to uh, exacerbating inequitable outcomes. So for example, we talked a little bit about the, the models that cost opposed to the models that don't cost, the differences with what you get with those models. Uh, so there's a digital inclusion issue or a digital poverty issue, depending on which way you frame it. Uh, we have spent a lot of time decolonizing our curriculum and ensuring that our curriculum is diverse and inclusive. But if we are now going to build curriculum based on generative AI models, are we taking a bias canon that does discriminate and has the ethical issues that both Paul and Mike have raised? Are we now going to use that to create and possibly take steps backwards with what we have done with our curriculum? So for me, there's a huge challenge around bias and equitable outcomes. And my final point comes from Pertu Polonen, who is a Finnish futurist. And he has written, and I love this, the next revolution is a human revolution. To counterbalance the world we digitalized, we need to develop creativity, perseverance, compassion, and curiosity. Those same soft skills that give our lives meaning and set us apart from machines. So ask yourselves, what can we get from, you know, what can we get from ourselves that we cannot get from generative AI? And I think for me, that is what it comes down to is that human side. How do we ensure that our human skills are better developed to live in a world with generative AI that has so many opportunities to improve who we are and what we have. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Mike, do you want uh, another word? Just taking a couple of quick points. One is about how education institutions respond. I absolutely agree that we have to work with students, not against students in um, developing policy. My worry is that now, looking at it from a systems perspective, um, education institutions are hugely interlocking systems. The, the exam system, the curriculum, um, the, the teacher education, that's very difficult to change. They've already been challenged by COVID. Now they're being challenged by generative AI technology. Always the approach is to say, we will do the minimum change. 
But I do think, as I said before, that education institutions, particularly higher education, need to work together uh, to develop not only appropriate change, but also appropriate new systems. And the other one is about bias. So the big companies have worked hard to uh, try and reduce, not eliminate, but reduce obvious bias. So gender bias, race bias. But what's left is implicit bias, um, particularly cultural bias. And I've tried having arguments with um, various versions of generative AI, particularly GPT-4. And it's, it's really instructive to have an argument, an intellectual argument with it. And what comes out is a kind of persona. And that persona is a kind of woolly liberal American persona, which is not surprising because it's been trained on you know, primarily English, primarily American texts, and then being given a gloss but, um, to try and remove uh, the most obvious bias. So what's left is a kind of cultural identity which um, needs to be made clear because that cultural identity has implicit bias built into it. So you're right that bias is something that we need to explore and challenge. Thanks, Mike. I'd like to hand over to Joseph now and hear his thoughts. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, and of course, thank you very much also to invite me to, to this very interesting webinar and to the discussion um, and also to the Commonwealth of Learning. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Mike, for your excellent presentation. It was very clear to me, very understandable. And I learned a lot about, uh, in particular, some uh, technical issues or technical things of the ChatGPT. I would like just to, to remark, uh, as, a, as an educator, as a professor, uh, some of your comments at the end of the presentation. And I would like uh, to mention, for instance, the, the, the educational model that we have in, in my university. I, I came from the Open University of Catalonia. Um, and this situation uh, from the generative uh, uh, artificial intelligence or the chat GPT, uh, it's a big challenge uh, for us in order because we have to to rethink uh, our educational model because I, I suppose many of the open educational institutions are based in uh, written uh, assessment and written uh, activities everything it's the it's the the, 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 the feedback with the students is uh, using uh, mails and write things not. And of course, we, for instance, I try to, to put uh, in the, or to ask to chat GPT the, the assessment that we are preparing for our students or the, the, the learning activities that we are uh, offering to our students. And the chat GPT uh, replies in a very good way. That means we need uh, to rethink uh, this situation. And, and I, I agree with you that at the end, uh, we have to. Uh, to, to, to ask or to, to find the, the, the basis on the education and the pedagogical practices as you as you mentioned in your book. At this sense, for instance, in my university, we are working now in a definition of a guidelines to, to, to rethink and to use and to embrace at the end the, the use of ChatGPT uh, with our students, but also, of course, with our professors. Because as, as, as Denise mentioned, we, we need to be also a kind of an expert of that in the uses. But I think we have to be experts on the educational use of this uh, ChatGPT. I mean, we, we have to, to think and to practice how, as a professor, uh, we can work better with this ChatGPT to prepare my learning activity, to teaching activities for the students. But we have to do the same uh, for the, the students, you know, how they can being an expert of uh, educational use of this to learn in a better way. No? At the end, I think uh, we have to start uh, working and learning uh, how to use with this kind of machines, uh, uh, artificial intelligence in our, in our activities and in our educational activities. But this is one thing. Not uh, I, I agree. Uh, of um, the, for instance, the the, the 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 examples that you that you mentioned, not about the 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 the, the tutor systems or the or the different the, the, the long list of the the pedagogies, not that the, you can we can use. 
and I'm a very optimistic person, and I think that this is a, a good, a, a very good opportunity for uh, our institutions, uh, not only for open uh, or distance institutions, also for face-to-face -face ones, because as you know, many of these institutions are starting to have in, on offering now um, uh, online courses. But they have another uh, question, another comment, not a reaction to, to your uh, uh, speech, uh, because I'm also an editor in chief of a journal. Uh, the, the name of the journal is International Journal of Educational Technology in Higher Education. And, and, and we have at this moment uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a complicated situation because we don't have, a, as you mentioned, a, a plagiarism tool to detect uh, if uh, the, the, the articles and submissions that we are receiving in the journal are uh, created by this uh, artificial intelligence and not it's a result of a, a research uh, studies or research activities. No? Um, yes, I think we have also to start thinking about that and the uses of this uh, artificial intelligence uh, to creation of uh, research or to dissemination of this research. No? Uh, before the start of this webinar, we were talking about the possibility to use uh, ChatGPT as a reviewer not for, uh, <laughs> for these uh, um, submissions, not that maybe we have to still maintain our human reviewers because I think it's important to have it, no? but uh, yes, uh, it's the same, for instance, in my university. We used to have a, a kind of a plagiarism tools to detect the plagiarism in the students, but now if the students are using this ChatGPT, it's very complicated to, to, to detect this. That, that means we have to work uh, together. Uh, we have to embrace, in, say, in some sense, this, um, this tool. Thank you. Thanks, Shazat. Mike, would you like to do a quick um, roundup before we open the floor because we've got some very interesting questions? I would just say one final thing, which is that I think we need to have confidence, confidence in ourselves as academics and as educators, um, and particularly about what works in terms of teaching and learning. You know, there are th hundreds, thousands of companies now that are offering uh, products based on generative AI, some educational products. Many of the ones I've seen are not based on good pedagogy. So I think we have an, you know, an, a, a need and a duty to speak up about what works in terms of good teaching, learning and assessment, and then how technology might enhance that. I really don't want us to become kind of slaves to the machine, that we need to be strong and speak up about what we know about, which is good educational practice. Uh, and you know, I hope we can uh, all work together to do that. Um, if so, then it will you know, be a benefit, not just to ourselves, but also to future gener generations, if we can develop a new pedagogy that builds on AI rather than just challenges it. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'd like to start the panel off with one question that's come through. Um, do we foresee a situation when school will finally die? And I want to encourage our um, participants today to put their hands up then and to ask the questions themselves. But let's start with that one. Um, Michelle, can I start with you? And then uh, we'll just go I through. Really, I really, really hope that the school of the future looks completely different to the school of today. Whatever that might be, if we are still putting pupils in rows and standing in front of them with a chalkboard, we are not doing a service to anyone. So I absolutely, hopefully, hope that we well, we will, we will see a completely different school. But good pedagogy is good pedagogy. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Paul. Thanks, uh, Michelle. Thanks, everyone. I, George Siemens said in 2014 that if universities, and I think that applies to schools as well, if universities think that our purpose is the creation of content, we have lost the plot. And I think with Gen AI and all these tools, it is just becoming more apparent. So our value contribution to, to society or to our learners is not to produce and to share content with them. They can find much better content anywhere else. 
our our role will change to to help them to evaluate the content to validate the knowledge claims and i think uh, Ronald Barnett from the UK already said that in 2000, he said, uh, there's now knowledge producers outside of universities, what is left for us to do? And his proposition is that we should become validators of these knowledge claims. So our, so, so just lastly, the school should structure learning journeys. There's a role for pedagogy, not content pedagogy, to take students through a critical pathway of how to evaluate these different knowledge claims and to, to help them to name the world according to their context, as Pauli Frey suggested. Thank you. Thanks. Joseph? I, I totally agree with uh, the comments, not in particular with the comments with the Michelle one, not. Uh, I think the school have uh, to, to change in the future, not, but uh, probably one of the things that I would like to add is that maybe uh, we have to focus more uh, on the schools and education, and not only in, in knowledge transmission, it's, uh, it's, I think we need to focus in knowledge creation and knowledge sh sharing. Not? I think this is the, the main uh, sense of the, the, the future of schools and the future educational uh, institutions. Thank you. And Mike, would you like to add to that? I would go back to what I said at the end, which is that teaching and schools are the caring profession. And you know, generative AI intrinsically doesn't care. It produces, but it doesn't have you know, human care. We care about truth and integrity. We care about learning. We care about effective teaching. And we care for our students. And we do that from our human experience. So schools will and must change. But that core aspect of caring for our students and caring for integrity and knowledge will still remain. So the new pedagogy will come in, but the core purpose of a school, which is to nurture uh, young and older learners, that will stay. So new practices, yes, but the core beliefs and the core pedagogy, um, I think will remain. Thank you, Mike. I'd now like to open the floor and we have a question here from Bhumika Agarwal, would you like to um, uh, tell us your question? Can we have the mic open? Yeah, you're muted, Vimika. Uh, hi, so um, I recently read some research about the lack of openness of chat GPT and the I think the research paper also had a couple of comparisons of different AI, of different generative AI, but con and it also used different parameters to check for openness. And that GPT failed on most of them. So, but despite this, I think one of the tools we are really talking a lot about is chat GPT. So any comments about this lack of openness, but still the high usage. Thank you so much, an excellent question. Um, I, I'm going to ask our panelists to take this question as they, they feel appropriate. So dive in panel. I'm, I'm happy to dive in. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. No, you go, Mike. Uh, uh, thank you so much for sharing this article with us. Um, I think it is a, a real issue, the openness, and uh, uh, this is what a lot of the court cases are now being um, uh, heard on, and this is a lot of where the challenge is coming from, is that we don't actually know what is in the, la the training sets, and this contributes to the bias as well, and we did address the bias, and we did address the fact that, that organizations are adapting their algorithms to deal with certain types of bias, but not all types of bias. So I personally uh, do think that there is a challenge with, with that black box mentality around what is in the training set for large language models. And it's something we need to be mindful of. And when we talk about responsible and ethical and legal usage of generative AI, that openness question comes into all three of, three of those responsible, legal and ethical usage. If I could just add to that, I mean, there's a kind of irony here that open AI as it became more successful, became less open. Um, and we don't know still what data set it was trained on. 
other systems are available. Uh, and I want to really emphasize that. Um, some of them for big corporations. So Llama 2 from Meta is open source uh, and um, it's you know, the, the training set is available for, for that. It's a smaller language model. And you know, there are other ones where, for instance, Claude 2 that are trained on more ethical principles. Uh, so we do have choices as to which system we use. I know that uh, that uh, ChatGPT has got the headlines, but I think collectively we need to make decisions about which systems we use. There are some issues with openness, which is that you know now, for instance, with the Llama 2 model, anybody can take that model and adapt it and add to it, perhaps uh, train it in wrong ways built on um, that uh, initial model. So just because it's open doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Um, people can take an open system and use them for bad purposes. But we need to make collective decisions, I think, as education institutions about which models we use and what principles they're trained on. I would really like to see one that's trained on good pedagogy, for example. And I think that will evolve too. So as new systems come forward and as the, as the skill sets come forward, people will develop their own tools based on their own training sets so that will improve the situation as well and if you haven't already compared for example Dali with Firefly uh, you can tell I think whilst they both produce excellent images you can tell that Firefly is all legit and that Dali too is scraping like everything so it, it is very interesting but like Mike said play with the different models and see what the outcomes are Um, can I um, ask Noor, Razina, Maud, Zain to ask their question? Thank you. You're muted. Please raise your question now. Can we unmute the speaker? Um, from my side, I've, I've requested unmuted. It's up to the speaker to unmute or pose the question. Otherwise, you can read the question, um, Denise. OK. Um, let me read it then. What is the best way to deal with plagiarism by using the chat GTP among students? Oh, go on, I'll start. Um, there isn't an easy way to deal with plagiarism, unfortunately. There is no one tool that will um, detect plagiarism. I think there are two approaches. One is if you suspect plagiarism, um, and particularly if you suspect a student of you know, relying very heavily on AI generation, then engage in a dialogue with that student. Don't just assume that your detector tool is accurate. You have to engage in a dialogue with the student. The other approach is to look for different methods of assessment. For example, moving towards more process-based assessment where you, for instance, uh, have a project that student is working on and you assess that project in stages, move towards more authentic uh, assessment, uh, which is based on, for example, uh, placements that a student has had on previous lab work so we and there are universities now that are coming up with they're not ai proof methods of assessment they're not fail safe but ones that well, we've been talking for a long time about good methods of assessment moving towards more authentic assessment process-based assessment this is an opportunity to explore more diverse ways of assessment not to outwit AI, but to test other aspects of students' understanding, particularly their critical reasoning. Denise, if I can just come in because, oh, sorry, Paul, I, I get concerned because quite often I hear people equate generative AI with academic misconduct, and then they can't think beyond anything other than generative AI means our students are going to cheat. There's a small percentage of students have, who have always cheated and will always cheat whether or not they use generative AI. So I agree completely with Mike. We need to then reframe our thinking. 
how can we best work with our students so that they can demonstrate their learning in the age of generative AI? Uh, Paul, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Uh, Mike, can, with large education, open distance education systems like the Open University of the UK with more than 200, 300,000 students, uh, UNISA in South Africa with more than 380,000 students, I think ChatGPT really raises the bar on a number of levels, not to check plagiarism, but to how, what advice would you give to large scale education systems like the Open University of, of Catalonia or Open University in the UK, where you have 14,000 students in Economics 101 and you cannot ask an essay on supply and demand anymore? I mean, I don't have an answer to that. Um, Joseph, I mean, maybe maybe you can. No, yes, yes, that I agree with your comments, no, because uh, before ChatGPT uh, was very clear, no, that the, the, we, for instance, in my in our university, we use uh, different plagiarism systems not to detect this plagiarism. But I agree at this moment we have to to rethink everything and we have to to start uh, change, uh, changing on, on thinking in a new pedagogies in order to 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 change the way that we are uh, using or preparing our teaching uh, activities, not and in that sense. Um, this is, the, for instance, the, the meaning of the guidelines that we are working now in, this, in our moment, in, 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 uh, in our university in this moment. Uh, and, and this is a, a work which is, is easy because for the teachers and, and also for the students, um, it's, it's, it's complicated not to, to understand uh, and also to find a new ways uh, to assess uh, the, 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 the learning activities, not but Yes, we have to do it uh, because at the end, uh, as I said, uh, I think we, ha we have to start uh, working together with these uh, machines, not? Thank you, Joseph. Uh, Christiana, you had your hand up. Would you like to raise your question now? Here she is. Can you unmute your mic, Christiana? And we're struggling to hear you. Perhaps you could put your question into the question and answer box and then we can uh, review it. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. We have one other question here from Justin. Uh, the advent of the internet was revolutionary. Is the advent of AGI just another te technical advancement or is it fundamentally different? Joseph, as we have you on screen, would you like to make a start to that answer? You're muted. Oh, yes. Uh... It's, uh, which one is the Janine? You... Uh, Justin Cross. It's in the Q and A. Oh, in the Q and A. Okay. If I understood uh, correctly, I think uh, yes, uh, it's a uh, it's a big change at this moment. Not uh, it's something that it's not. It's a, it's very new, not for for us, and, and it, it's important. Not as uh, as I said uh, at the beginning. That it's an, a great opportunity, you not know, to to rethink uh, um, our educational models. Um, and I think it's not um, something that we have uh, before. Probably we can compare this with the starting of the of the internet, not when we start uh, using and that the change there, for instance, for open universities um, before internet use uh, and after internet, not. But I think now we have a, a, a clear new situation that we have to to work with uh, in order to define a new pedagogies for this uh, this situation. Thank you, Joseph. Um, we are um, running out of time. So I would like to make some final comments. I think um, Mike's introduction gave us a lot of knowledge 
some know-how where we can go and look and how to find out more and offering a really considered opinion about what's going on. But with a discussion from all our panelists, and I'm delighted we had such a deep discussion because we've raised the level of how to think about these issues. For me, uh, you know, we've moved into epistemology. And in fact, in some ways, we're moving into philosophy. So um, if we think back to what our first universities were constructed for and how they, um, how they actually trained their students, which I've been looking at lately, is um, it was all about argumentation. And a student could only try to deconstruct the master's argument. And only later could they start to construct their own. And in the UK, we're at a time now when we're going to have a REF, a research assessment exercise on all our work in the universities. And we're talking about four star publications. And what's a four star publication? Now, maybe ChatGTP can tell us very concisely, but actually a four star publication is where there is a very strong narrative and argument and a discussion about the topic from both sides, but, may, but then ending up with your own opinion from evidence and looking at other sources. And I'm very delighted to say that's what we've done today. And we've really set the ball rolling. And, you know, what does all this mean? Because, you know, with Paul's discussion and raising ethics, which of course are important and very, very important about bias. But what does it all mean? Um, I think Mike made a very important point. You know, this is just a system. It doesn't know. In fact, it's a child, it's amoral, it knows nothing. All it knows is to create more text that follows on in a logical way. So the academic community needs to take this problem, adopt it, embrace it and deal with it and raise the level of our own scholarship, which can enthuse our own students. And in fact, the final issue that I think you've all raised is what does it mean to be human? And let's take that forward. But thank you to all our guests and speakers today and to you for joining us in this very exciting discussion. And I hope we can continue this later and follow up with things in the Commonwealth of Learning and perhaps in Eden too, Shosa. But thank you all. And I wish you all a very good day or evening, wherever you might be in the world and take care. Thank you very much. <laughs>